and welcome to week 11's lectures on the picture of Dorian Gray. In today's session, I'll be continuing the discussion on the Gothic setting of this novel. We stopped at this particular description in the previous um, lecture session. I want to revisit this particular description because it has a lot of significances uh, in terms of how view uh, how we view uh, the setting in relation to identity let me read this again Wilde seems to choose the room deliberately in order to contrast and uh, perhaps mock the character it used to accommodate with this uh, with its picture the proof of degradation the room has not changed it should be changed much over the past five years during which it was locked Yet there are marks of dilapidation, a faded Flemish tapestry, a curtained picture, an old Italian castle, and an almost empty bookcase. That was all that it seemed to contain, besides a chair and a table. The whole place was covered with dust, and that the carpet was in holes. A mouse ran scuffling behind the wainscoting. There was a damp odor of mildew. Now, according to the critic here, this room was chosen specifically by Dorian to make a point. Now, what is that point? He wants to contrast his old personality with his present personality. Therefore, he chose to house his portrait in this old school room. And this school room does contain marks of dilapidation. It's, it has signs that it is uh, not very well kept up. It's not a very well-maintained room. It is um, full of dust. Actually, the description says the whole place was covered with dust. And we also have holes in the carpet. So we understand that this room was not a place which was uh, well dusted or well maintained. Look at the word faded. The Flemish tapestry, the ornamental um, carpet like um, a fabric that was hung on the wall as a uh, ornamental piece was faded and the picture is curtained. It's not open to the view of the person in the room. It's curtained. So, um, and then um, there's this chest, um, the Italian chest in the room. It is old. Now, all these suggest not just dilapidation, but there is a sense of secrecy. Look at the word curtain. Why is it not, um, you know, open to view? So there is a combination of um, dilapidation and secrecy associated with this, uh, with this cold room speciality. And, of course, there are references to mildew, a mouse running about behind the wainscoting, that is the paneling, uh, or running uh, across the bottom of the walls in this room. So, his school room is usually associated with innocence, but isolation, but now this kind of innocence has been corrupted by the behavior of Dorian Gray. The description reminds a classic Gothic room, which not being used um, the case. It is the room connected with Dorian's whole life. Firstly, it witnessed his miserable childhood, later conceals the proof of his downfall. In any case, entering the room reminds Dorian either of past unhappiness or present degeneration. There's another gothic space in the house. Dorian uses a secret press in a library where he keeps his uh, disguises. When he murders Basil, he puts there Basil's belongings as well. Gothic fictions commonly employs secret passages, as, uh, secret places as passages or trapdoors. Dorian uses the press to hide his corruption. Now, this uh, schoolroom. Let's first um, finish up our discussion of the schoolroom. Now, this schoolroom is, as we understand, associated with his. Um, unhappy childhood. His childhood had been uh, miserable and later the same school room is used to conceal, to hide his uh, present corruption. 
in the schoolroom um, holds the proof of Dorian's um, black soul, that picture that he keeps hidden in that room is the uh, testimony. In fact, it is a living testimony to Dorian's corrupted soul and present uh, degeneration. In addition to the schoolroom, which has Gothic um, resonances because of its, um, you know, faded ancient quality, dusty place, and yet there is a living, throbbing uh, picture in that room. So this is one uh, classic Gothic setting. There is also another Gothic space, uh, which is in um, the library of Dorian Gray. Uh, in a secret uh, press, Dorian keeps hidden his various disguises, his costumes, and uh, once he has murdered Basil, he also puts Basil's belongings within that uh, same space in the library. It is very interesting um, to note that Basil is the one who painted the portrait of uh, Dorian Gray, and Dorian Gray himself uh, murders Basil and the remains of Basil, his um, clothing, his, uh, his belongings are put in that uh, press. So the house seems to contain all the um, things associated with that portrait. Gothic fictions, as we understand, uses a lot of um, specific architectural um, uh, attributes such as you know, secret passages, hidden passages that nobody uh, knows, secret nooks, um, uh, niches, and trap doors, of course. And um, Dorian does use the hidden space in the library for his purposes, for his uh, degenerate art behavior, for his um, you know corruption. Dorian Gray enjoys leaving the respectable West End in his quest of immorality which he can only find in the working class areas of the East End. There he gets forbidden pleasures while he denounces morality going native. Still, the Victorian morality code does not allow him, a gentleman from higher society, to mingle openly with the lower society. Therefore, he can only assimilate with the working class dirty habits in disguise and more importantly at night. Uh, in the previous um, slide, we saw how Dorian hides his disguises um, in the hidden space in the library. Um, now we uh, see that you know he has to uh, resort to this kind of disguise um, because certain pleasures are forbidden for the respectable classes. Dorian Gray while he enjoys the respectable society, also enjoys the pleasures of the disreputable society, the pleasures enjoyed by the working class members of um, the London uh, society. And he cannot enjoy these forbidden pleasures in his usual garb. Therefore, he disguises himself in order to go native, in order to um, impersonate the uh, appearance of a working class figure so that he can enjoy these forbidden pleasures. Now, Victorian um, respectable world does not allow a gentleman, a sophisticated um, gentleman from higher classes to uh, openly associate with the working classes. Therefore, if Dorian has to enjoy the pleasures usually uh, enjoyed by the working classes, then he has to um, he has to kind of go in disguise so that he can become one with these uh, working classes, um, so that he can enjoy these uh, dirty habits, and these can be attained uh, most uh, um, uh, likely in the nights. So you can see a secretive life for um, Dorian. In, in these kind of moments in the novel. So Dorian has this um, respectable facade in the daylight. He has this uh, disrespectable um, identity at night. So there are multiple identities for Dorian Gray.
Wilde's description of the desolate places of East End are intensified as the author focuses on the gloomy weather as well. A cold rain began to fall and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. Some from the bars came um, the sound of, from some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter. In others, drunkards brawled and screamed. Dorian observes a sordid shame of the great city on one of his journeys to those parts. Now we get a, a picture of East End and East End when it's being described uh, is described along with a, a particular kind of weather that is bleak weather, rainy weather. Um, and London becomes especially grey and ghastly during such weather. Um, and look at the way the world is um, visible. It's not uh, crystal clear because of the rain. Um, the, the rain is cold. Look at the word used to describe rain. The rain is cold. It's physically cold, but also metaphorically cold because there is no warmth in these spaces, um, literally and metaphorically. The street lamps do not give visibility. Um, there is a blurring scene uh, all around and um, the, the, there is mist as well, further obscuring visibility. So the weather is constraining. The weather is something which is not conducive to a very comfortable uh, presence in these uh, streets and um, public houses. Um, the bars were closing at night and dim men, look at the word dim, men who are not very visible and again there is a metaphoric significance as well. Men uh, who are perhaps um, mentally dim as well, women who are mentally dim as well. They were kind of huddling together in groups, in small groups and look at the uh, choice of the word uh, broken, the adjective broken used to describe these groups. They are broken groups. There's nothing wholesome about them. Uh, they are broken perhaps um, so spiritually as well and they're just huddling um, around uh, their doors and um, despite this bleak atmosphere there are sounds of laughter but these laughter the sounds of uh, laughter are not pleasant to hear um, which is usually the case with laughter but now it is horrible laughter not something that's terrible there's this horror about this laughter so you can see that this scene is very gothic in tone, both uh, in terms of color, because um, the rainy weather offers a particular color to the scene, gray, um, dark, and, and uh, nothing is crystal clear. And at the same time, there is a mental tone being offered by the kind of sounds that emerge from the street scene. In others, we, we see uh, in other moments of this um, street scene, we see um, drunken brawls, drunken fights and screams. So there's laughter, horrible laughter on the one side, and then there are screams of pain on the other. And um, Dorian Gray notices that this kind of uh, street scenes are manifestations of the shame of this great uh, London city. Um, and, and he notices this during his uh, journeys to this uh, space. The dramatic sky is depicted as well, adding to the gloomy atmosphere. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time, a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy like the black web of some sprawling spider. Dorian, wearing a cap to cover his face, watches the environment as he is traveling in a hansom whose side windows were clogged with a gray flannel mist. It suggests his separation from the place, hiding it from his eyes. This is some of the fantastic uh, descriptive passages from the novel. Look at the choice of the word um, yellow. And this word yellow becomes an adjective to this word skull, yellow skull. And it's bizarre to find this phrase, yellow skull, being used as a descriptive term for the moon. 
the moon is like like a skull yellow skull yellowing skull something that is um, getting rotten something that is um, without any kind of bright life now that's that's the kind of um, emotion Dorian feels when he looks at the moon as he is traveling in this uh, cab in this carriage handsome uh, cab and um, everything is misshapen and ghastly uh, look at the word uh, cloud the clouds are um, known to change their shapes but the word misshapen immediately um, gives us ideas of uh, things being aborted and distorted um, so that again is an indication of the mental attitude of Dorian Gray. He sees everything to be distorted, but even the cloud and um, the gas lamps um, throw a particular kind of light onto the scene. And even these gas lamps are fewer as he progresses down his um, passage um, through these streets. The streets are very narrow, again an indication of the kind of lives that these people led, the low classes led, and gloomy as well, lives are, are bleaker. Um, and look at the uh, analogy again, like a, like a black web of some sprawling spider. And, and even the streets look as if uh, it's being woven, that, that they are being woven uh, as a spider would uh, weave a black web, a dark web, and there's a sense of being entrapped in this uh, speciality. Now, uh, Dorian is hiding, he's in disguise, he's using a cap to cover his face, and uh, when he's looking at uh, this environment, um, nothing is very clear. There are uh, hazy images that he sees because of the gas lamps, because of the mist, because of these cloudy um, uh, skies. Now, even the cloud, this misshapen cloud, is like an arm that, that kind of hides the moon and, and uh, again further throwing the scene into darkness. So the, the greater sense that one gets from this um, passage is that uh, life is very bleak, the soul is uh, bleaker, gloomier, just as the streets are, the, the skies are. Also, the sounds of a barking dog and the screaming of a seagull add to the horrible scene. Dorian believes that ugliness was the on, only one reality, that ugliness was the one reality, the coarse brawl, the loathsome den, the crude violence of distorted life, the very wildness of thief and outcast were more vivid in the intense impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. The area truly belongs to the working class, as the den is located near the docks in between two factories. The place seems not to be accessible for everyone, because the chain door opens after Dorian gives a peculiar knock. We further get very, very vivid images of these um, working class pockets. Uh, um, it, it's fantastic description that uh, one finds in this novel. Um, the sounds of animals, such as a barking dog and a screaming seagull, the noise of the seagull, add to the uh, atmosphere, the bleak atmosphere, the strange atmosphere, the gothic atmosphere, the horrible atmosphere of this particular working class area. And Dorian uh, genuinely uh, understands that the only reality in the world is, is ugliness, and that ugliness is beautifully described in scenes such as this. Um, what is really concrete and tangible uh, and, and real are these fights, the, the crude fights um, that he witnesses, the hateful den that he visits, uh, and, and the violence, the heartless violence, um, that emerges from broken lives, um, you know, the wild, the evil nature, the disgusting nature of the thief and the outcast, the person who is in the margins of society or outside of respectable society, these are very real to Dorian Gray. In fact, he says these are uh, more vivid than all the shapes of art that he sees in the galleries, in the sophisticated circles. And this particular area is truly working class, um, the one that uh, Dorian visits. And it is um, 
it's it's a place where one finds um, factories, um, the dockyard, and uh, it is not accessible to everybody. And even uh, Dorian has to knock in a particular way to get admitted. There's a secret code. Not everybody has access to this code to this working class district. Now, um, this is a, a scene that is very very vivid that that one uh, gets to see in this novel. The house epitomizes decay where terrible orgies take place. Even the person who opens the door for Dorian displays symptoms of degeneration, being squat, misshapen figure that flattened him itself into the shadow, where he overcomes another obstacle which separates him from the opium, a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind. Again, the wind adds a dramatic element to the setting. Now, um, the den, the, the house where all these uh, indulgences uh, take place is a uh, representative of decay, of degeneration of the human soul. And even the person who admits Dorian into that house is like a shadow because of um, his consumption of all these uh, uh, substances. Um, look at the choice of the word uh, misshapen again, used here with a figure. Um, the human being is misshapen here. Previously, uh, we saw that the cloud is misshapen, you know, aborted, distorted. And here it is the figure, human being, that is misshapen and uh, aborted and, and turned into a shadow-like thing. And um, uh, there, there are uh, further obstacles um, that uh, uh, prevent um, Dorian from accessing the open. And what is that obstacle? That, that's a green curtain. Uh, and once again, we are reminded of curtain the pictures, the curtain portrait um, in, in Dorian's room, school room, and uh, the, the curtain itself seems to be a space, um, a living thing that uh, kind of moves in the gusty wind, and um, the wind kind of gives life to this thing. Again, the atmosphere is shadowy, uh, bleak, eerie, scary. Uh, things and people are distorted and aborted, there are secrecy, um, secret codes, even the way one knocks is, is a particular kind of knock so that uh, it becomes a password-like thing um, for somebody to be admitted. All in all, it's, it's gothic decay that we sense all around at moments like this in the novel. Dorian crosses a dilapidated dancing salon and continues to uh, ascend a staircase to a darkened chamber. The location of the top and the darkness once more hints of a hints of forbidden place. The smell of opium meets him on the way as he sees grotesque things. The place serves Dorian at first merely to experience the working class underworld and find pleasure. Later, the only means to forget his sins, uh, sins and embrace new ones. So within this opium den, um, before he gets to that particular place, um, there, there is a, a dancing salon, and he climbs up a staircase to a dark chamber. Again, this passage is uh, gothic in its setting as well. Um, there are staircases, darkened spaces, and um, this particular dark chamber is at the top. Even in Hed She Wells's um, the red room, the the particularly um, you know horrifying room, the red room is is removed from the rest of the house. Um, it's far away. I think uh, one can uh, read The Red Room, it's a short story by H.G. Wells, um, to understand how the Gothic works in the short story as well. It's a fantastic story, I would recommend it. Um, here too, the particularly uh, dark chamber is at the top, once again far removed, and we're also reminded of the schoolroom, which is at the top, far removed from the rest of the household, and there's a sense of um, the forbidden associated with this place, and he sees um, people lying about in grotesque, um, you know, uh, shapes and, uh, and, and um, positions, and the place, the entire place is a... Uh, um, is an opportunity for uh, Dorian Gray to enjoy the underworld of the working classes. And he does uh, find pleasure which he uses to forget his sins. Uh, and and um, he also uses his place to experience new sensations as Lord Henry Wooden had uh, recommended, advised him. And um, we understand from the novel as we read that despite his efforts to forget his sins, he is unable to do so. The setting seems to be a strong indicator of the Gothic in the novel. 
The abandoned room at the top of a large house which hides the changing picture resembles Gothic chambers which served as a concealment. There is another secret place in the house which hides Dorian's disguise as well as Basil's possessions. The author, it should be the T-H-E, the author also provides a vivid depiction of one of Dorian's journeys to the East End. While portrays a gloomy night, atmosphere of dark streets and shabby houses. He intensifies the scene with grim weather and disturbing sounds of a barking dog and a screaming seagull. Dorian likes to sink in those places of ill repute where he can get opium and enjoy the company from the bottom of society. Now, let's sum up the Gothic setting utilized by Oscar Wilde in this um, novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Now, there are uh, a list of um, spaces which are um, illustrations of Gothic attributes. Firstly, the, the schoolroom, which hides the picture, the changing picture. Um, yeah. Dorian secrets that picture in that uh, space, in that large house. Um, so the house is hiding that picture, that, that soul. The house becomes then this physical uh, body and the picture, the portrait in the schoolroom becomes the heart, the soul, the spirit hidden away behind a curtain. Now, there's another secret place, as we saw, it's in the uh, library, uh, in the press, uh, the press that uh, Dorian uses to hide away um, his disguises, as well as the belongings of Basil Holbert once he murders um, Basil. So, the possessions of Basil, who's associated with the picture, as the painter of the picture, is also hidden away in that house, in that house in the library. So the schoolroom has the picture, the library has the disguises and the belongings of um, Dorian Gray and Basil Holbert. Now, the schoolroom is associated with childhood and it's very ironic to see that the child has grown, grown into a monster. And now the library is associated with the intellect, with the mind, and that place is also corrupted and the library also uh, hides or secrets all these costumes and um, belongings of, of, of dead people and, and people with multiple identities as Dorian possesses. Now, East End itself becomes a gothic space. Uh, East End is full of dark streets, bleak, gloomy streets, narrow passages, and shabby houses where you know groups huddle in front of their ways and there are drunken brawls and screams um, and, and plenty of violence uh, being um, you know uh, staged in those open spaces now that is also very very gothic um, space the working classes themselves become gothic the working class spaces also become gothic um, their laughter becomes horrible and terrible and gothic the fights are of course their violence is of course gothic we also have the sounds of animals such as dogs and a screaming seagull and these also add to the gothic sounds the soundscape of the picture of dorian gray now, Dorian likes to visit such spaces. Dorian is drawn to such spaces. He's drawn to the schoolroom. He deliberately chooses it to mock that space, according to the critics. And um, Dorian is um, perhaps enjoying corrupting that uh, space of the library, the space of intellect, uh, by uh, hiding away his costumes. And he enjoys um, you know, participating in the wildness of the East End. He is almost one with that community. He knows um, to get uh, admittance into that society. Uh, he indulges himself to the full so that he can both experience the pleasures of these classes, working classes, as well as forget himself, forgive himself, forget himself um, of the kind of corruption that he performs during the day as well. So. Um, the Gothic space of East End becomes a fantasy, an escapist world for Dorian. He tries to forget his corrupted soul by uh, drowning himself 
in these sights and sounds, in these pleasures um, that, that the bottom of the society offer him. But we realize when we read the novel that uh, he can only go um, uh, thus far, but not completely. He is not able to forget himself. He is not able to forget his sins. He is not able to forget the corruption that he has um, committed. And uh, eventually, as we know, that uh, he tries to kill the portrait, destroy the portrait, uh, in order to completely eliminate all kind of evidence of that monstrous soul life that the picture is, but he fails. He fails fatally because when he murders that picture, he murders himself. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.